Thank you so much, and welcome everyone to our Leaders in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion conversation. It's an exciting end of the year. We're happy to have everyone join us today. As mentioned, I'm with the EDGE in Tech Initiative, which is the Expanding Diversity and Gender Equity in Tech Initiative at the University of California. And I'm here with my co-moderator, Gigi Estillo, uh, who's the Student Services uh, Advisor for the summer sessions here at Berkeley Extensions. Gigi, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Welcome. So glad to see you all here. My name is Georgetta Stilo, or Gigi for short. She, her pronouns, and I'm a student services advisor at Summer Session Study Abroad and Lifelong Learning. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are excited to have a very special speaker today. I will say uh, we will invite questions at the end, so please put them in the Q&A as we go along and we'll address as many of them as we can. Our conversation today is with Kim Jenkins. As PayPal's Global Head of Diversity, Inclusion, Equity and Belonging, Kim Jenkins works to ensure these guiding principles are deeply embedded within the organization's values and reflected in the company's commitments to employees and customers. In this role, she guides PayPal's company-wide initiative, strategy and initiative, as well as the development and implementation of values-led initiatives that bolster the company's culture of equity and belonging. She brings a global perspective to this work with an intentional focus on inclusive talent acquisition, development, retention, and employee engagement efforts. Prior to joining PayPal, Kim served as the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for KeyBank and was responsible for enterprise strategies to maintain a diverse and inclusive workforce, workplace, and marketplace. Kim is also a certified public accountant, CPA, and with more than 20 years of experience in accounting, finance, and capital markets, leadership roles at Bank of America, Deloitte, Deutsche Bank, and JP Morgan Chase. Kim serves as the Board of Trustees of the Urban League of Greater Cleveland, where she sits on the Executive Committee as Treasurer and is Chair of the Finance Committee and Co-Chair of the Audit Committee. She recently completed a five-year term on the Board of Directors of the Greater Cleveland YMCA. She earned her Bachelor's of Science from Rutgers University, and she is a Certified Public Accountant and Six Sigma Certified. So, with all this amazing financial background, you're a CPA, can you tell us your story and how you came to the work in diversity and inclusion? So first of all, let me, let me just correct one thing here. I served as on the board of the Urban League when I was in Cleveland, I'm no longer in Cleveland. So I need to make sure I update my bio for that. But they, let me just talk about um, how I ended up here. This work actually came to me, I didn't come to it. And so I was in a fully functional finance role, but I have always been involved in diversity and inclusion efforts off the side of my desk, getting involved in events, going to conferences, helping mentor, guide, and coach underrepresented minorities in the workplace. And I always did that with the same amount of passion that I did my day job. And so in the spirit of people are always watching you even when you think they aren't, when an opportunity came open at my prior organization, our CEO asked me to take the role. And being honest with you, I said, no, I hadn't seen myself in this space, quite honestly. And I didn't really want to be the brown girl doing diversity and inclusion work. I was the brown girl chasing the CFO title. My why, my purpose was because I always wanted to create hope for people to see themselves in spaces where they may not have seen themselves before or may not have felt there was an opportunity for them to be able to occupy those spaces. In the spirit of, again, people are always watching you, um, I had to create my legacy statement in one of our executive development programs. And my legacy statement said nothing about finance. It said nothing about being a CFO. It said everything about creating opportunities for people like me who have come from inner cities and who want to be able to experience opportunities that aren't necessarily paved for them. And the path forward is not clear. And so I realized then I could have bigger impact in this work 
not doing it off the side of my desk, but actually doing it as my day job. I have to be honest and tell you, I had absolutely no idea what this work really was in practice. In theory, it made a lot of sense. In practice, it turned out to be a lot of things I didn't know, but everything I was passionate about. And so Jill, to answer your question, I found myself here because somebody saw in me something I didn't see in myself. And by always being my authentic self, somebody recognized where my true passion lied and where I could do my best work and have the biggest impact. And so that's how I ended up in this space. That's amazing. And, you know, it's really exciting to see where you ended up at the intersection of finance and, and diversity and inclusion. So you're at PayPal. And I, I had the opportunity to get to know PayPal. I used to work at eBay. And this whole idea of democratizing access to the marketplace, democratizing financial literacy, um, you know, I think PayPal really came into an interesting space where they're like, how do we make you know, money transfers, something that, you know, everybody has access to. So maybe tell me a little bit about how, you know, you, you came to PayPal and how PayPal is approaching DEI. Okay. Well, let me also start by saying, I hope you have experience with PayPal by being a PayPal customer as well. And if you do, thank you for your business. But at PayPal, we have a set of core values. And that's important to me as I was deciding where to take my career I needed to understand that the organization was grounded in this work, was not just doing it because it was a nice to do or a buzzword or a tagline. And so one of PayPal's core values is inclusion. Our mission is to democratize financial services and create a more inclusive global economy. We live this every day in everything we do for ourselves, for our customers, and for the global communities we live in, we do business in, and we serve. I will also share that wellness is another one of our core values. We care, we demonstrate empathy, and we have a genuine appreciation for the fact that everyone is uniquely shaped by their individual experiences and the things they have been exposed to. We understand that our perspectives may be different than someone else's, but that doesn't mean one is right and one is wrong. That means to each individual, their view is theirs and is representative of who they are. And we can all peacefully coexist if we understand the value of our unique perspectives. And because that's who PayPal is, that's why I wanted to bring my career to PayPal. Now, the business we do, as I mentioned to you, is to democratize financial services, to serve clients and communities that may not have access to or want to be experienced in typical banking types of functions. And so that in and of itself speaks to who we are and how we approach the work and why I'm so excited to be a part of this organization. Yeah, that's amazing. The role of wellness, especially in this era of COVID, in this era of a lot of social justice crises, um, mental health is part of the whole experience of being an employee these days. Yeah. Gigi. Thanks, Jill. Um, so I, I really resonated with me uh, your, your journey and you know, having more representation um, in leadership roles, especially for women of color. Um, so as the global head of DIEB, what is your mandate in this role and how does your C-suite support you? Okay, a two-parter. So let me start with the first part of that. So overall, I'm responsible and more importantly, Gigi, I'm accountable for driving and influencing a culture of equity and inclusion. It's about awareness. It's then about acceptance and appreciation. So first we have to help people see a perspective that might be different than theirs. And then we have to have people value that a different perspective isn't wrong. It's something that we each can learn about. And then appreciating that all of us are unique, our authentic selves, and we all bring value in our own different way. So my mandate, Gigi, is to teach, is to create learning moments to meet people where they are and find a connection to bring them along our journey. This is a journey. This isn't something that you're just gonna start and stop. We say this is a marathon, not a sprint. It's about being clear and transparent about what we are doing and what we are not doing. And more importantly, why are we doing the things we're doing? Our aim 
is to be inclusive and equitable to ensure we remove barriers to create opportunities for everyone and to ensure no one is left behind. No one is being overlooked. No one feels marginalized. No one feels unappreciated. Those are the things that are important. You see, we call it D-I-E and B. The belonging is our North Star. That's the part that's important to us. And how does my C-suite support me? Let's talk about that for a second. My C-suite doesn't only support me, my C-suite rolls up their sleeves and do the work with me. I like to say we're all partners in progress. That's a catchphrase that I've coined across our organization. I work for all roughly 28,000 of our employees globally. And it's important not to lose sight of the fact that we get the opportunity to be inclusive in every decision we make. We like to say everyone's a leader in our organization. And I'm not the only one in our organization that makes decisions. On a daily basis, every one of us makes decisions for each other, for our customers, to support our shareholders, to align with regulatory guidelines, to support our communities. We all make decisions and we all have biases. I like to say, if you're a human with a brain, you have biases. And when we can accept that, we can all find ways that we can do things differently or be more inclusive. So we're doing this work together every day, at every level, at every role, and every function. And my C-suite doesn't see it as Kim's job to do. They see it as all of us are responsible for creating the culture, emulating the values, and being a culture carrier on a daily basis. That's really wonderful to hear that, you know, your C-suite is actually getting in the weeds, doing the work that's necessary. Um, and a lot of times people think that diversity and inclusion is this top-down process. Um, what are the avenues that staff have to be involved in this work? And, and you know, it sounds like they are. Um, can you please provide some examples of how that, that's reflected? Mm -hmm. So when we, when we think about this work, we think about engaging everybody, but first we have to start by making sure everybody sees themselves in the work. So oftentimes you'll hear people say, I'm not diverse. And so you have to start there. You actually are. There's something different about every individual. Like I started, I said, it's about your unique perspective based on your experiences, your exposures. Nobody can be you, but you. By default, that makes you diverse. We're not all carbon copy, cookie cutter images of each other. So when you help people see it like that, as opposed to some of the myopic boxed in views of what diversity has been labeled as being in the past, then you can bring people along because you've met them where they are. And once you have people wanting to understand, know more, hear more, get a different perspective, then we have lots of ways people can get, on, get involved. We have eight different employee resource groups, ERGs, within our organization. And the value of that is while you have the comfort of being in your specific community with people who share an affinity as you, you also have the ability to realize as much as you are similar, you're different too. And so then you start seeing the value of the differences. And so at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is make sure that people find ways to connect on what's comfortable to them, but also are willing to embrace the discomfort that it takes to be able to do this work. And in getting involved, we pull people into things like conferences, to recruiting processes, to sponsorship and mentoring programs, to things we call like random connect, just get to know somebody who you don't already know, may never have had a reason to connect with, but hear somebody's perspective in a random way that you just get connected to somebody. Relationships are important. So build those relationships. You never know in a corporate structure who you might be working with or who you might need to lean on or who support you might need. Get to know people who are different from you. And so our ERGs allow that for people. They're volunteer efforts. But what they also give back to people, GG, is the opportunity to demonstrate your leadership capabilities. Show someone when you're not doing your job what you're capable of doing. And when you're super passionate about something, your superpowers kick in and you're the best you can be in ways that people may have never seen before. And so that's how, those are just some of the ways where our employee population can get involved. 
Yeah, I definitely find that ERGs, when um, they are prevalent in organizations, they oftentimes um, invoke opportunities for us to be leaders, like you mentioned, and not only be um, confident in our roles, but to to thrive in them. And I, I, I agree that they are very important in this work, in the everyday work that we do. Um, and you mentioned that you are serving over 28,000 um, <laughs> employees across the globe um, in doing this work. Are there any things that you've been surprised about um, or disappointed about in enacting this change um, that maybe didn't measure up to your expectations or maybe exceeded those expectations? Okay, let me go back to something too and just say the value of an ERG is when the ERG and the membership has a voice that is valued and respected. And also when the ERG is empowered to help drive those cultural changes. Most of them are volunteer efforts. And so it's important for people to not lose the passion because it feels like it's thankless. And so with that, I'll pivot into surprises. Let's just say this universe surprises me every day. And the work that we do is not just based on PayPal work, it's based on the environment in which we operate. And so on a daily basis, something will happen that will surprise me. And being honest, oftentimes things will happen that will disappoint me too. This work can be thankless. It can be exasperating. It can oftentimes be disappointing. Some days you can lose hope, but every day you have to keep moving. You have to remain focused on the long game. Nothing that's worth having comes easy. And people have been at this fight much longer than I have. I coined this phrase, it's okay to not be okay, but it's never okay to let the disappointment paralyze you and impact your ability to remain focused on why we do the work we do. So some things that can be disappointing are things that you think are second nature to people. They should know it. That's a bias we have to accept that we have, right? Why do you think somebody should know what you know the way you know it? You are unique based on your experiences and your exposures. So we get past that and help the teaching moments be actually teaching moments, not confrontational, not judgment, and not punitive, moments to learn and raise awareness. And so oftentimes you realize it's difficult for people to accept. That can be disappointing. But on the flip side of that, imagine how good it feels when the light bulb comes on, when people see your perspective, when you can hug it out and walk away, when it felt like it was not going to end like that. That's the success of, of this job, I think. And for me anyway, my interpretation of how to manage through the disappointments. And then what I like to say is when I hear people saying the things I've said, and I don't have to be the only one saying it, that's when you know you're making a change. When people actually start embracing the shift in the culture and you can see it in the things they're doing, that's when the disappointment goes away. That's when you get excited. And those are the things in this work that you have to keep looking for. You're not gonna win every day, but you get to a point where you have more wins than losses. And at the end of the day, that's what happens. I like to tell people this, we're in this together. And since we're in the spirit of football right now, let's use a football analogy. I like to say, and this work, it's got to be collaborative. So I can have the best end zone touchdown dance ready on cue to just go for it, right? But if the receiver is not ready to catch, the O-line is not protecting my quarterback, my dance doesn't occur. And everybody gets a Super Bowl ring on the team, regardless of the role they played. So when you think about it like that, this isn't just about me. This is about all of us doing everything we do to make PayPal the best PayPal it can be for our employees, for our customers, and for our communities. And so that's where you got to work through the disappointment because you've got to bring everybody along. That was a long answer to your question, but 
it really touches on all the things that I believe make this work worth continuing to do. Yeah, definitely. And I loved uh, your football analogy. It is football season. So I love that. Um, and I really appreciate you, you naming that this can be considered thankless work, the emotional labor that is often not recognized, but um, not letting those um, challenges or disappointments uh, hinder you from moving forward. And, and I think that working through those disappointments, like you said, um, and, and taking in those wins that are oftentimes more um, prevalent than those losses, right? So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Jill. Thanks so much. Um, before I jump into my next question, I want to share a comment that was in the chat just because I think it's so um, so amazing and would love your reaction. So Jay Kenzie um, says, I was recently in a work meeting where someone asked me to lead our diversity efforts. I immediately let fear set in and felt they should look at someone with 10 plus years experience, but she saw something in me. I quickly let go of that fear and accepted the opportunity. Your opening statement resonated with me. So yeah, do you have advice for other people who might be like, I'm not ready or I don't have the skills, but they, they're asked to step up? I would say this, in the spirit of being confident, you can hyperventilate on your own time, right? Go for it. What's the worst that can happen? right? You fail fast, you learn some things, but at the end of the day, you find out how to do some good work. We all make mistakes, but in the spirit of the long journey, hopefully we make a mistake once and we learn from it and we keep going. So kudos to you. I think you said the name was Jay. Kudos to you, Jay, for taking that leap. And if you're in the role right now, when you ever need help, you know how to find me, reach out, phone a friend, and I will gladly help you do that. But to anybody else who feels it as their passion, get involved, maybe get involved from a volunteer effort, do some of it like in an ERG or something like that. Fuel your passion and you'll realize where your path is really heading you. And maybe it's in doing some more of this work. But just remember, like I said, the disappointments are going to come. Just don't let them cripple you in a way that you can't get beyond it. And most things in this work are outside of your control. As long as you think about how do you influence the things you might not be able to control? How do you meet people where they are? How do you bring people along? And how do you not lose people along the way when it gets too hard, right? When a decision is made that you had nothing to do with, but it impacts how you feel. Take your moment. Do not let yourself think you can't feel the way you feel. Remember the long game and keep it rolling. I guess that's what I would say. Go for it. What do you have to lose? Absolutely. Might find fun in it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, some of the things that you've said so far have really resonated with me to make sure no one is overlooked. I've never heard that definition for belonging, but I really, I really like that because it hits, you know, who is most vulnerable, who is most um, at risk, and how can you ensure that those people are re retained and brought on board? Um, I love the partners in progress. I also love that phrase, I'm not diverse. Um, yes, kind of, yes, you are. And, you know, celebrating not only the similarities, but celebrating the differences as well. And then, you know, kind of closing on that ERGs, the super passionate is your superpower. So I love that. That's a great way of, of activating your superpowers to think about how you can bring that into play. Like you said, even either in your side job or in your main job. Um, but kind of going back to, you know, this, these really big issues, right? Like there's diversity and inclusion issues, but there is a significant wealth gap in the United States today. There are small businesses that are really struggling to survive. And I can't remember the data point, but women of color are starting small businesses at exponential numbers, really tremendous numbers. And so how do we help those small businesses? Um, there's of course, gender equity, um, all these different issues, how does PayPal address these things and how does that fit under the umbrella of diversity and inclusion? Okay, let me, let me start with this too. There are so many things that define diversity, right? And, and make a person diverse. But I do always say this, you don't get credit for being diverse because you didn't have to do anything to be that. It's like a fish doesn't get credit for knowing how to swim. 
It's just what they do and who they are. The real work is inclusion. And so are you willing to be inclusive with somebody whose diverse characteristics are different from yours? And so when you start seeing these things like a racial wealth gap, if you're on the winning side of said gap, do you feel an obligation to help those who are on the losing side of that? Because there is a losing side when you think about the data and statistics around this racial wealth gap. When you see gender inequity, do you feel obligated if you're on the winning side of that gender inequity to potentially take a pause and see how you can help? PayPal does a lot of great work in that area. When we recognize a need, we figure out how we can help. For example, recently, and these are all things that are public that people can find and read, but recently PayPal made a $108 million commitment to the women's economic empowerment effort. That's not just us talking about DIEMB, that's us putting our talent and our treasure behind a commitment to help do our part. Last year, we made a $535 million commitment to advance social justice and racial equity. That wasn't just about cutting a check. And $535 million is a lot of money. It was about finding businesses that were being impacted that may have had no way to overcome the things that were happening to them and helping them, not just with money, but with tools and resources too. Recently, just about a week or two ago, we published some work that was a big body of work that was done with the Black Congressional Caucus and with two HBCUs to really talk about the racial financial health gap talk about the wealth gap and talk about FinTech's role in potentially helping drive that forward. We have lots of initiatives to help support small businesses. We in our organization give people time to volunteer to the things that are important to them. So it's not everybody go support this thing, it's everybody find the thing that is your thing, that is important to you, that feels good to you and leverage the support of PayPal to give your time, your talent, and your treasure to help drive that change. And I talked earlier about our ERGs. Our ERGs, while aligned to affinity, anybody within our organization can be a part of any affinity group, any ERG. I'm part of all of them. And so we do a lot of work where we find partnerships that we want to get connected to and get involved in. I can give you a couple of examples around that too. So for example, our $535 million was focused on social justice and racial equity in the US. And our black affinity group called Amplify was helping lead the charge on how we manage through that. Our women's economic empowerment initiative, we have internally our social innovation group, but also our unity group. That's our ERG for women globally. We had our Asian employee resource group, which is called RISE, actually help us develop partnerships in the moment when we were dealing with xenophobia, right? And so there were significant things that happened and we started looking for ways to say, what is our responsibility? What should we do? We're in these communities, our employees are being impacted. And in the spirit of, I said, it's okay to not be okay. Some days you're dealing with external things that have nothing to do with your job, but you can't separate yourself from this is happening outside in the world. And it is impacting me because of who I am. And so I need to be able to know that I feel supported. At the very least, people appreciate the fact that I'm going through something. So those are just some of the things. And like I said, they're all public. So anybody can read and find them and see exactly what work is being done. It's not just talk. It's not just writing a check. It's about really putting the spirit of who we are, our moral compass, our value system behind the things we say we care about and actually doing the work.
Yeah, as a fintech company, do you feel an additional um, burden that goes beyond like fostering belonging in the workplace to what is your accountability to helping financial literacy or helping, you know, people access financial resources? Do you feel like fintech has a, an extra burden or extra role here to play? So I don't know if I want to specifically say fintech, but as a human being, right? Let, let's start with that. As a human being, I feel that we have a responsibility to think about people who are disadvantaged by no fault of their own. Let me say that again, by no fault of their own. Now, if I just make bad decisions, then maybe I need somebody to educate me, right? But if I have never been educated on the right way to do certain things like manage money, have access to money, if the deck may potentially be stacked against me, we've read all of the research about how the financial wealth gap has become a thing, right? So if the deck is stacked against me, who is going to help me understand how to do this thing a different way? Who is gonna shift the cards so that maybe I can actually have a real hand to play? That's where I think the responsibility comes. Now, from a FinTech perspective, I think that as the world shifts, this is me personally telling you what I think, as the world shifts and becomes more technologically focused, and I say as the world shifts and people much younger than me are saying, what shift? It's always been technologically. Well, it, it has it, right? So as the world shifts and becomes more technologically focused, we really have a responsibility to start thinking about what does that mean? How do we make sure people have capabilities and access and education and empowerment, while at the same time, while they're safe, right? That's important. You have to keep people's stuff safe as well. So there's a big body of work connected to that as well. So to go back to what you asked, I think everybody has a responsibility. I think FinTech is well posed and poised based on where the world is headed. Thank you. So I just wanted to address one of the questions that's in here from one of our attendees, um, you know, describing the uh, work that you're doing within the community. Have you any specific success stories about holding folks accountable for behaviors that might exclude without leaving folks feeling ashamed? ashamed? And if there's any other stories helping folks become aware of their power and privilege without having their defensiveness torpedo the whole thing. Um, so it's another two part question, I guess, but. Okay, so hold me accountable for answering all parts of that. Let me start by saying this. Um, I think you heard me say that the only way to do this work is if it doesn't feel punitive. We've all seen the work done that feels like this. You are racist. What does that help, right? And again, we have to realize everybody is living their life based on their own perspectives and experiences. So it's about meeting people where they are and bringing them along. And so if we talk about a success story, let's think about something as simple as this. There was a time last year, the year before, where everybody in a recruiting function was applauding why blind interviewing, and the word blind can be taken as a microaggressive term because sight is a privilege. Let me start by saying that. But the blind, that's what I'm doing quotes, the blind interview process, everybody was excited. If you take the name off a resume, if you remove a face from a resume, from an interview process, you don't make people have to be seen. You mask their voice. You will increase the representation in your workforce. I don't know if you remember that, but that was the whole thing. When you pause and ask people this question, but then what? So let's use me for an example. You have to remove my name, hide my voice, hide my face. I'm talented, I'm skilled, I get the job. What happens the day I show up? I'm showing up with my face, my voice, and my name. All the things you felt you needed to hide to get me here. So is this about fixing me or is something broken in the culture? And when you help people see it like that, it's not punitive, it's not intended to make people feel bad or whatever words were used in the question. 
is literally about helping people think, what is the real end game here? Do we have a culture where diversity is accepted or valued? And when you start seeing people do that differently, that's where you start seeing the change. That's where you see the success. When you think about something like this, if you look around anybody's table, and let's just use this for an example. Everybody looks the same, went to the same school, worked at the same company before they landed where they are. All you have to do is ask a question. How did this happen? You don't have to say to anybody, you have a bias. You only hire this from that, that you know, and, and. You help people see something happened to lead us to this space. And if we're open and objective with ourselves and introspective in the moment, we can think about how did we get here? If I am the leader, why did I hire all the people I hired? Do I have a bias? Now, we like to say things like this too. And let's go back to football for a second because clearly I'm stuck in the season. Um, we all have our favorite team. That's a bias. But let me tell you something, when the rival team shows, we're ready for it, right? How we show up in that moment is how we show up because our team is our team and the rival is not something we want to know about, right? We want to crush them. That is a bias and that's okay. If we're interviewing two candidates and the candidate has that familiarity bias to me, then along with it comes the confirmation bias. This person went to my school, they've got to be good. This person used to work where I worked, they've got to be good. So if there's talent that shows up, can you, that's different. Can you even see that talent? Do you even recognize that our talent or have you already written it off? When people start to see things differently, that's the success. And the more times we see that happen, the more it occurs. And then the ultimate success is when people want to stay. We can hire all the people we want to hire. But if the minute we get them in, they realize this is not a culture where I can be successful, where I can bring my authentic self, then they're gonna leave. So what was the point in all the efforts on the front end? You bring people to the front door, the back door is open and you're losing people. That's the retention play. So at the end of the day, your retention will tell you, your attrition will tell you, are you doing the right things inside your house, inside your company, inside your organization, on your team? to keep the talent that you've worked so hard to recruit into your organization. So that's what success looks like. That's how we define success. That's how we see success. It's not a numbers game to us. Do I have six of these, seven of those, eight of those, and seven of those, right? That's not what it looks like. Am I X percentage this and X percentage that? Do I have in our organization, do we have in our organization top talent? that can be their authentic selves and do their best work to serve our customers and our communities, while at the same time feeling valued, appreciated, respected, and feeling like they belong. That's what's important. And that's what I say success looks like to us. You talk to anybody else in my seat at another organization, they may define success a different way. They may actually do targets and quotas and goals that's not what we do, and that's not how we do it. We're looking to move our bar, but we're not looking to make it a math exercise ever. Thank you. Yeah, um, when trying to foster a culture of respect and value, being valued and being your authentic self, I, I really resonate with that because I think, you know, everyone is seeking an organization that supports them in that way. Um, there is another question here from an attendee. What advice do you have for DEI professionals building their DEI functions from scratch within a business or organization? Listen, a lot. If you're building it from scratch, you have to really try to define what are we trying to do? That's so important. And the we is the collective we. So it won't be, what am I trying to do as a DEI, and we call it DINB at PayPal, but as a DEI professional, it's not about what am I trying to do because you can't do it alone. 
So number one is listen. Number two, make sure everybody understands it's not just your job. It's everybody's job. Every place a decision is made, there's an opportunity to be inclusive. So you need to do that. And you need to realize plain vanilla won't work. Push down, top down, makes people feel like something is being done to them, not with them. Like something is being forced on them and anything that's being forced on you, you haven't had the opportunity to influence it. You haven't had the opportunity to drive it. You haven't had the opportunity to share your perspective. So it feels different. And this work is all about how people feel. When we did this, this research around, we were, D and I, we're trying to figure out what did we wanna be? Everybody was moving to DEI. And what we asked is, well, what is our North Star? What are we really truly aiming towards? And we were aiming towards belonging. So we decided to be D-I-E, and B. And so in doing that, we were very clear about what are we trying to do? And it means something different. Belonging means something different to everybody, even though we realized it's a human necessity, just like air and water. Had no idea how significant that was, but the need to belong is that important to people. And so when you realize what you're aiming for, and everybody's going to be aiming for something different, when you realize what you're aiming for, then you build the strategic approach to connect that work to everything that happens, not just to your own DEI body of work, but to everything that happens in that company. Because it matters everywhere. Product development, product de design, innovation, marketing, branding, launches, pitches. Who shows up for a pitch? Who is the client? Do you know who your people are? So it's all of that work that needs to be done. And so I would say, just start thinking about who are we, but let people tell you who you are. You might hear different things and find the synergy. And then what are we trying to do? You will hear different things, find the synergy. And then how do we do it in a way that's inclusive? That's your sweet spot. That's your superpower helping people see how to do the things they already have to do because it's their job in a way that they can be more inclusive. That's how you do this work. And whoever asked the question, I hope I answered all the parts of your question. If I didn't, throw some more of it in the chat or reach out to me personally. Thanks so much. I'm going to ask one more question and then we will fully turn our attention to the questions in the Q&A since we're getting about 16 questions there lining up. Um, my last question for you would be, can you talk about the efficacy of these DEI JB initiatives, right? And why have they not moved the bar further and faster? You know, what do we have to do differently? So thank you for that question. And I'm going to give you the perspective a la Kim Jenkins. It goes back to the, what's the bar? What are you measuring? What are you trying to move? If the focus is on representation, then you're going to think you have to hire stuff. And you're going to applaud yourself when you hire stuff. And you're not going to realize all the stuff you're hiring is leaving because you haven't done the stuff in the middle to want to make people stay. If your focus is on an engagement survey, a month before the survey, you're gonna make people feel really good, right? And then the results come out and then you do nothing else until the month before the survey, right? If you're not paying attention to what's going on in the world that could be impacting people and creating safe spaces for people to be able to release that stuff, especially in a COVID environment where everybody's detached from their workplaces or now just starting to go back to work and now you don't know what's getting ready to happen with what's coming. Are you still in tune with your people if you're not bumping into them in the hallways? Do you know who they are? I say this, I started my life as a finance professional. There was no way I could have blown my budget on a regular basis and not had repercussions. In this work, people have to be very clear about what are you aiming towards? What does success look like? And be real honest about what does it look like when I haven't achieved success? 
it's real easy to say we need the business case or we need to be able to present this or we don't have time to do this until you find the value in it. And that's the collective view until you find the value in whatever your it is. You can't achieve your it. And so you'll be stringing this work along as the world keeps shifting and changing as every day the universe is gonna punch you in your nose with something else you can't control. And then what are you gonna do? Get disappointed, potentially get dejected, potentially get disillusioned and your spark fizzles, your passion wanes. And then you're just sitting there trying to figure out how to be relevant when the relevance of the moment you think you're solving for has left you a long time ago. So if you ask me, what I say is this, be very clear about what you're trying to do. And to the point I made to the last question, listen to what people think success looks like and then aim to solve for that. Don't just aim to play the representation game. You'll lose all the time. And then Caitlin kind of followed that up with accountability. How are you held accountable? How do you hold people accountable? Okay, so that's an interesting one. And so accountability to us looks like, you know when people are being inclusive, and you know when they aren't. Let me give you a perfect example of that. Let's say we were in a meeting or on a call and somebody says, oh, I have this idea. We should paint the wall blue and nobody pays attention. Nobody even hears it but you. Then somebody else says, oh, I have this amazing idea. We should paint the wall blue. And everybody like wants to like raise the ceiling. Like this was the best thing we've ever heard. In that moment, someone has been marginalized. Why? What happened? If you're silent, then you are participate, participating in that moment. You're complicit in that moment. If you say, hey, how is that different? Help me understand. How is that different than what so I just was about to say, if you see somebody's voice being minimized, you stick up for them. That's accountability, holding yourself accountable. Nobody should have to hold me accountable for doing the right thing. I should hold myself accountable for doing the right thing. However, in the moment, if I was a person who overlooked said person, somebody should call me out. Not rude, not disrespectful, not confrontational, but somebody should say, hey, that happens more often than not. Can you tell me why? I had somebody tell me once, I don't hire women. Okay, probably not legal for you to say that, but you said it, okay. So we pulled aside and had a conversation. Tell me why. And let me tell you how that made me feel in the moment as a leader. And this was a long time ago in my career. As a leader, what you have just told me is that you can't be objective. You can't truly assess talent. Then you shouldn't be a leader. Have you ever considered that? And I was junior in my career, probably the stupidest thing I've ever done. It could have been career limiting. But in the moment, if I hadn't said that, what would happen to every other woman who deserved a chance? And so I said, give me a chance. Let me prove you wrong. Worst case scenario, you're right. Let me prove you wrong. And he gave me a chance and I committed to proving them wrong. So how do you hold people accountable? You call them out politely and nicely because I don't think anybody's wrong. I don't think anybody's malicious. I just think people don't know. They have no idea. Like a microaggression that any person of color who's listening to me, when people say, can I touch your hair? I don't think people are malicious. I think people are curious. So touch my hair, but let me just help you understand what that felt like in the moment. So I say that to say, people want me to say things like, oh, you have to have metrics. Oh, you have to have this. Oh, you have to have that. Oh, you have to have these things. And these people want those things, but what does that do? That can incent people to do the wrong thing. If I say to people, you have to have six of these and five of those, people are gonna do whatever they need to do to get six of these and five of those. But are the six of these and five of those set up for success? Or are they just here to solve the thing, right? So accountability comes back to the making sure people understand in the moment they could have made a different decision or done something differently because somebody is impacted in a way they might not be able to appreciate. 
That to I mean, me is accountability. I like your approach through inquiry. It reminded me of a story of uh, an executive who was telling me how she would go to a manager and say, is this person ready for promotion? And the person would say, no, not yet. And then six months would pass. She'd ask the question, same thing would happen. So she changed her approach and she was inquiring. And she said, is, is this person ready for promotion? And the, and the manager would say, no. And so she, she would then say, well, why not? It's your, your now, can you explore what this person needs? Can you give them the skills so that in six months they are ready for a promotion? And so I like that, that nature of like, how might you have answered that differently? Or how do you think that might have made someone feel? <laughs> well, and let me double click on that too. And if you're the manager and six months ago, they weren't ready. Six months later, they're not ready. Six months later, they're still not ready. Manager. Exactly. Do you hold yourself accountable for not getting your team ready, not guiding and coaching and developing? So where is your responsibility in this? So it's that. It's the remove the subjectivity and lay the accountability where it lies. Thank you. Gigi, who's up next in our questions? Thanks, Jill. Yeah, so... Um... I have a question here from Carlota. What competencies do you see are needed to be successful in this role? People often jump into DI roles due to passion, but don't have the technical skills to be sustainable. That is like the $6 million question. And let's just say I had none of the skills, or at least I thought I didn't, but someone else thought I did. What I did have was the ability to drive change. What I did have was the ability to lead initiatives. I did have the ability to be genuinely empathetic. I had the ability to be confident about being my authentic self. Meaning, what is important in this role is that you understand that to do this right, you're gonna make a lot of people unhappy. People are going to push you away from what you know is right. So it goes back to the thing I said to somebody asking when you start in this role, listen, figure out who believes in this work and figure out who doesn't. Don't assume everybody does. The ones who believe in it, those will be your champions. Those will be your advocates. The ones who don't are the ones you're going to have to influence the why does it matter scenario and help them see themselves in the work. So you have to have that level of confidence and thick skin to know it's not about me. One thing I've learned a long time ago is my talent belongs to me. My opportunity and my job is a space I rent. As long as people are giving me an opportunity, I have a responsibility to demonstrate what I can do in that seat. But nobody owes me that opportunity if I'm not driving change and delivering. So the passion only gets you so far. The excitement only gets you so far. The collaboration, the ability to understand that you've got to be able to find synergistic ways to connect people who are on your side and people who are not. You have to find ways to influence and drive change, even if it means nobody wants it. But the real value in this work is, can you execute in a space where you're not really responsible for all the things that have to happen for you to be able to drive them forward? If none of the people report to you, but all of the outcomes do, can you do it? Your passion isn't gonna make that happen. Your savvy, your commitment, your willingness, that's the stuff that's going to make it really happen. People say, do I need to go and get these um, certifications? If you have no clue what diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging are, you most certainly need to get the certification and understanding and some clarity around how to drive the work forward. If you are really focused, you should volunteer first. That's what I say. You should volunteer first. There's lots of opportunities to do that. But by all means, don't sit on the sidelines if you want to get in the game. And sort of building on that, Yolanda Fitzpatrick says, um, I'm currently in a financial ops 
So that'll resonate with you and desire to transition to formal DIEV role. Um, and she wants to make the career change into this space, but the job descriptions are all calling for 10 to 15 years of formal role in DEIB. So how do you negotiate that when you have all these years of experience, you're a financial leader, but they're saying you can't make this transition because you haven't been doing this for 15 years? So that is some of what we call um, an opportunity to have inclusive hiring practices. Do you have the skills needed to do the job is important. Have you demonstrated the skills needed to do the job? That's important. Have you done the job is important to some hiring managers, may not be important to others. The trick is to be able to find your transferable skills and connect them to the things that are needed in the space. If you're in a finance ops role, you're putting out fires every day. Stuff doesn't wanna work, doesn't wanna reconcile, doesn't wanna to hang together, the numbers just won't foot, but they cross foot, makes no sense. So you're doing that kind of stuff on a daily basis. You're being creative, you're being innovative. Find a way to sell your skills to a manager that will appreciate that. Maybe the recruiter is doing what the recruiter is told to do, fill these must have. Maybe meeting and having a conversation with the hiring manager may create an opportunity for you. It may be an opportunity at a lower level than the level you're at, but if you want it, would you be willing to take it and start over? Get involved in an ERG. Move yourself up to the leadership ranks of an ERG. It's a volunteer effort. It adds more work. But if that's the sacrifice you have to make, are you willing to make that to show people what you're capable of doing outside of what your day job skills and capabilities will say on a competency matrix? Can you say more about inclusive hiring and what is the future of hiring? How has it changed? How are algorithms and AI changing hiring? Because uh, I feel like that plays into this. Woo, you brought up the algorithms and AI. Okay, so let me just tell you how algorithms and AI work. It's based on significant amounts of data used to determine an outcome. If you're using significant amounts of data, then your underrepresented populations could potentially be at more of a disadvantage than you expect them to be in that environment. So I'll say that there. The future of hiring, in my mind, goes to a lot of different things. It goes to the when we recognize our biases, or do we capture them in the moment we're making a decision? When we're doing things like confirmation bias, performance bias, are we being objective or have we learned that maybe we're not being objective and are we able to course correct? If you think about an environment today where we have learned we can work remotely. So if I used to sit in this space, my company is in this space and I only hired in this space, but the diverse population in this space doesn't necessarily exist. Now that we've worked remotely, does location and geography play less of a role in sourcing my talent? Can I reach places I haven't reached before that may be more diverse populations? that may be an HBCU across the country that can give me talent, that may be in a Latinx community where people are coming out of a community college as rock stars and looking for opportunities. Do I approach people earlier in their career? Because quite honestly, some of the things that are happening today, there's not a person on a college campus that has learned how to deal with those. So do you find ways to give your talents back to a an organization to an educational institution to be able to help develop, guide, and coach students coming out of college? Do you capture students earlier in the career life cycle to help guide them to a path they didn't know about? Do you teach people about um, the fact that there are jobs in DIE and B that people may have never have heard about coming out of high school and now they can lead into a career path in college about that? Do you help universities attract talent based on a specific set of skills that kids don't know they need? And I say kids loosely, but that students before college don't know they need. 
because they never experienced it. So there's the inclusion in the, can you open your mind about what will be needed, not today, but five, 10, 15 years from now and help people be ready for it. So they're not spending their time getting stale information. So, and can you open your mind to the fact that talent may look differently than what you think talent should look like? That talent may look different than what you look like. Or do you expect that only people like you are talented, right? So those are the things you help people try to understand in inclusive hiring practices. You do some of that by looking at who got hired, looking at who got interviewed and looking at who didn't get hired. And if you start noticing things, trends, you ask some questions. It's all about listening and asking questions. It always goes back to that. And you leverage the new capabilities and the tools and you find ways to think about it. There's been a lot of research challenging some of this AI, but it goes back to people know what they know. So if you look at the information, you look at the outcomes and say, maybe this is doing something different. Perfect example, and I'll stop talking. A friend of mine is 6'6", six, six, and there was this AI exercise at the airport. He kept getting counted as three people. Why? Because what they considered the average was five, six. And so the thing kept, like trying to figure out what is this? And so there's a flaw in the data that's fed into it because it has determined what average is. What average is would be based on majority, right? So you've got yeah. to always consider that. Yeah, I was reminded of uh, thinking about intersectionality and there's always the joke, you know, a this, this, and this walk into a bar and you ask the question, could that be one person? And the answer is usually yes. <laughs> Yep. Gigi. Thanks. Um, so um, kind of taking it back to PayPal specifically, there's a question from an attendee. What does PayPal do to make sure there are opportunities for advancement for people of color, particularly Black women? And this is not just opportunities for advancement, but for actual uh, advancement to happen um, and to ensure that the bar isn't at a different level for people of color. Okay. people of color. So thank you for that. So we make sure, and, and that's why equity is part of our, our term, right? Not equality, but equity. And so there's a difference between those two terms and everybody knows the difference. So I won't bore you with that, but we make sure to the point where we're meeting people where they are, we understand what are the potential barriers for different groups of people, not just for people of color, but for everybody, what are the potential barriers and how do we adjust those? For example, if you ask me to sponsor somebody and I get to pick the person I sponsor, I'm going to pick somebody I'm probably comfortable with. But if you say, hey, here's top talent that I need you to sponsor and you send them my way, you may connect me to somebody who I may not have for various and sundry reasons, not have chosen on my own. That's the intentionality of how programs get created, how participants get defined. We have mentorship programs, we have sponsorship programs, we have networking programs, we have pipelining programs. We engage our ERGs, which have leadership at lots of different levels to make sure we're reaching into communities that we don't necessarily reach into us. We're building some of our programs. We let people influence the design and the outcome. We look at who has participated in the past, who hasn't participated in the past, who should participate. All of our talent practices have inclusion aspects in it as well. So all of those things are intentional and deliberate. So nothing gets lost on us that we may be leaving a population behind. So remember earlier when I said, we make sure people don't get left behind. Now here's, here's something that's always important about this work. I'm gonna tell you a secret in case you hadn't noticed. I'm a black female. I know it's a surprise. Nobody realized that. Um, I try to make sure that as I do this work, I'm focused on everybody, that I'm not just focused on it from my specific affinity or relation. And so I also try to make sure the things you can't see about people that people may not be comfortable disclosing, we recognize as well and look for opportunities there too. And so some of what you see makes it easy. Some of what you don't see 
makes the work more difficult. But when we say we don't leave anybody behind, we don't leave anybody behind. And so we're intentional about how we make sure people get the same access to programs and opportunities. And the last thing I'll say here is, and if we realize we don't have something that serves a purpose, we find a partner, we create a program. Perfect example about that. When George Floyd was murdered last year, we realized that our black population needed support from black caregivers. And so we needed to make sure we had that. We realized in some scenarios that we needed to be more intentional about the accessibility of some things. Those of us with sight forget that sight is a privilege. So we might create this amazing PowerPoint slide and people are struggling to see it. When we're interviewing somebody, we assume this Zoom thing works and people can hear, but do we have to put a capability together? So we just had a whole fireside chat with um, Haben Garma, who is the first deaf blind lawyer from Harvard. And she taught us some things about our products in the moment. So we had our product inclusion person on the line to talk about some of the things we're doing and how we're doing it. So we're always listening to learn and making sure we're not leaving any person behind. That's internally. And that's our client base and that's our communities as well. I think that broad definition of accessibility is so key. How do, and especially for things where financial tools are so important to daily life, how do we make sure everybody has access to it? I know we're getting toward the end, so I'm going to roll a bunch of questions into one. Um, so Tanya wanted to know, kind of following on of that, like, what are the eight ERGs? Kind of what ERGs do you need? And then I want to roll that into there are some questions about being a global company. So what does that ERG mean perhaps in other countries? And then the final piece to that, of course, is remote. So one of our attendees said, how can you demonstrate ROI to board members by a remote-only organization newly focused on DEI? How would you begin to demonstrate this? So kind of looking now at your role in this more complex global and remote environment. Okay, no pressure, but you're gonna hit me with like a 10-parter. Okay, I had to write some of that down. Okay, so let's, let's start with the second one first. Global, we first have to understand that diversity means different things in different places. So in the US, we're hardwired on race because that's how we were established, right? Race and then gender. Globally, we focus on gender. But if you're in India, there's a hierarchy that exists. That's different than what we specifically deal with in the US. You've got to understand that's diversity. If you're in some locations, um, I'll use the, the bad term, it's cast, right? You've got to deal with that kind of stuff that determines how you can, even who you can sit and eat with, right? So you have to learn about what matters to people around the globe and be intentional about how you create programming and support for those types of things. So it's making sure, back to the point I made, plain vanilla will never work. Understanding who you're serving and what their needs are is what's important. And in a global environment, that's what we do. ERGs. There's no right number of ERGs to have. You have to have spaces within your organization for your employees to find their communities or affinities. We have eight. Some are focused on um, ethnicity, on gender, on capabilities, on sexual orientation. We have eight on veteran status. So we have eight, so everybody can see themselves. And we have one more that people are asking us to create, one for parents. One thing parents have learned during COVID is you might intersectionally be all of these things, but being a parent comes with its own challenges and you need to talk to somebody when things are happening. I always say to people when, when like their dog pops up on, a, on, a, on Zoom or their child runs in the room, like they're not the problem you are. You're not even supposed to be home. Like for years and years and years, you've been at work and your dog has been doing whatever dogs do when you leave them at home. Now you're in the house and you're like yelling at the dog for doing whatever they, and, and your child wants time. They see you, they want you. 
they're expected to have, you can't expect them to understand that the world has changed and now you have to sit in front of a screen. So mommy's not really home, mommy's at work, even though it looks like mommy's at home. Like, how do you expect the child to understand it? So our parents have asked us, can you create a space for us? So when we've created the space, we might make it official, make it an ERG. The last thing, a remote environment with your board members. If you're doing business, then this just becomes another thing you talk about. People look at, I'll use DEI because that's the way it was pitched in the, the question. People look at DEI like it's an add-on to everything else. And when you look at it like that, it feels like a burden. It feels like it's optional. It feels like it's incremental. But when you look at it as this is foundational and core to everything we do, just like risk, you think about it differently. And so then the conversation will be had. So I would just say, raise the exposure of the work by pulling together a why it matters. You might happen to be a person in the space that has to build the business case, but the business case has been built over and over and over again. So that's not net new work that needs to be started. You can just leverage what's out there. Lots of good research and benchmarks around it. I think I hit all three pieces. Did I miss anything? And so now I want to give you the chance for anything that perhaps we haven't touched on that you want to touch on as we go to the end of the year here. How do we make sure everybody gets a Super Bowl ring? How do we make sure everybody's doing their touchdown dance? What's your advice? Well, this, here's what I say. Always find a reason to clap for yourself. That is one thing I say on a daily basis. If you're waiting for somebody to clap for you, you might have a lot of disappointing days. Always find a reason to clap for yourself. Focus on self-care and wellness. This job takes a lot out of you and nobody really knows what you're going through, what you're processing, but you. And that's for all of us, no matter what role we're in. And so always focus on your self-care, make it a priority. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. It's not easy. A judgment is going to be made, a law is going to be made, a decision is going to happen, a verdict is going to come in something's going to happen outside of the environment that you don't really understand. Keep charging forward. And then the last thing I'll say is, like I said, when somebody asks about stepping into the space, just go for it. If it's your passion, figure out a way to get involved. Listen to what is needed and solve for that. That's what's important. When you listen to the need, you can find a way to solve for it in ways that are innovative and creative that nobody might be thinking about because you yourself have a superpower. And it's your responsibility to let your light shine. Don't ever diminish your light in any scenario. Thank you so much. And then Gigi, last thoughts. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Kim, for really such an amazing and insightful chat today. Um, I just wanted to take the time to thank everyone that has participated today in our audience, as well as thank you to you, my co-moderator, Jill Finlayson, and the Berkeley Global team for such an amazing DEI speaker series. Um, this diversity and inclusion series has been greatly successful and will continue on in the new year. More information to come with some of our um, great speakers for 2022. Um, but if, you're, if your New Year's resolution includes creating more inclusive workspaces, check out some of our prior talks on YouTube and the classes at Berkeley Extension because we need folks like you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>